evening everyone gathered here welcome to the leadership lecture series titled my entrepreneurial journey and go to market lessons learned presented by alumni and corporate relations office iit madras i'm angelina r working in the office of alumni and corporate relations i'm here to introduce the speaker for today's session mr venkat d rangan he is a co-founder and cto at larry incorporated Mr. Venkat D. Rangan graduated from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras in 1981 from Mechanical Engineering Department, following which he received a MS Computer Science degree from University of Miami, Coral Gables. Mr. Venkat D. Rangan is a software executive and technologist with over 36 years of experience, leading designing, architecting software products for enterprise and product organizations of various sizes ranging from early stage startups high growth phase as well as large enterprises he is currently the co-founder and cto of clary a revenue platform provided for business to business companies prior to clary mr venkat d rangan was the co airwell systems gartner's highest ranking e discovery company which was acquired by symantec symc in the year 2011 I now invite our dean of alumni and corporate relations, Professor Mahesh Panchaknula, to address today's gathering, please. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, we are delighted to have Venkat here talking to us. So these kinds of life lessons don't come cheap. You know, having built businesses and failed, you know, we only hear the success stories. Please, <laughs> uh, the success stories, you know, are sort of touted. quite widely the failure stories are not talks like this sort of tell you the hard part of entrepreneurship and you don't get to read this in any textbook you don't get to read about these anywhere else so this is a valuable resource for all of us uh, just to put some numbers you know iit madras has 53725 alumni as of july 31st just after the convocation of these One in twenty say on their LinkedIn profile that they are a founder or a co-founder. That's almost five five percent. It's about three thousand founder co-founders. I don't think there are many universities in the world that can have that can boast of this kind of a founder, this kind of a founder co-founder base. Now, in that group, there is a much much smaller group of people who have done multiple startups and succeeded at many of them. and venkat is part of that extremely small group of people that have done this multiple times so there are a lot of lessons for us to learn when we have speakers like this so we are delighted to again welcome venkat he is from the class of 18 venkat this audience is self selected group of future entrepreneurs so i wish one of see one of you comes back 40 years after in the year 2062 to do a talk exactly like venkat is venkat is doing now okay over to you thank you thank you mahesh for the kind introduction really it's a great honor and privilege to be here really really i'm uh, very thankful for the alumni office for inviting me and for all the arrangements today to uh, uh, take a tour of the campus and learn more about how far iit has come in the last iit madras has progressed over the last uh, 40 years we've been uh, uh, arranging a, a ruby reunion this week and uh, so it's been a, a great pleasure to come back and uh, reconnect with my old roots as you can see uh, i graduated in 81 mechanical engineering i spent my first year at alaknanda and four years at kodabi those days uh, btech program was a five year program so um, you know basically i you spend the first year in alaknanda and then four years at uh, uh, future you know the second to fifth year hostel in one of the select hostels and i would uh, again claim that godavari has been the best hostel <laughs> <laughs> contentious godavari contentious and near from godavari Oh, okay. <laughs> Next time I'll make sure more more happens. I do understand that this time of the year it's more of a 
a break for undergrad students. Okay. So it's probably unlikely to find Godavari students. But also I found out also that today was, you know, they, they've been renovating the hostel and nobody is there. So maybe that might explain it. <laughs> Three out of the four years, we won the Schreiter. So we're all proud Godavari. <laughs> The, the one thing I recall, uh, you know, 40 years ago as I was uh, contemplating, you know, joining IIT was uh, the dreaded JEE, of course. I got through the JEE, but that wasn't my last hurdle. Um, I was always, you know, petrified about the weight limit. Uh, I was under the weight limit. So I was always, uh, you know, in trepidation that I might not uh, get through to the next stage of uh, the selection process. Uh, I'm glad I got a waiver. And uh, I also got a merit convened scholarship, which was uh, really, really super important for me at that stage in my life. And uh, really thankful for everything that IIT Madras had offered me those four years. But beyond those four years, I would like to say, you know, IIT Madras has established such a great brand you know, that brand has carried me through along the way in my entire journey. From where I left all the way to today, uh, as co-founder at CTO of Clary, you know, uh, as Mahesh mentioned, there are so many IIT Madras uh, co-founders, especially in uh, Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area, uh, you know, in very important positions. And uh, that, along with the continued excellence of uh, my alma mater, you know, of which I'm really proud of, really has uh, carried me through. And uh, I'm really, really grateful for everything that, uh, you know, the Institute offered me just in those five years as well as beyond as well. So uh, I wanted to quickly flash through my journey. So as uh, uh, Angelina mentioned, you know, I switched over to computer science, completed my computer science in 83 from University of Miami. Those days, uh, Big Tech was not offered for computer science uh, program. So that was my opportunity to explore uh, something that was different. And at that point, I think I took a chance. I just took a chance that, you know, learning about uh, computing, both hardware and software, was uh, something new and uh, not too many people were talking about you know computer science and software then so I, I just took a chance and uh, I really enjoyed it I enjoyed every moment of you know programming software product building and working with people and building great products and software and hardware as well um, after I completed my MS program I joined a startup you know, I, I just walked into that startup. Uh, again, I wanted to emphasize one part of my entire career, which is about building my network. Uh, and my network building started there. Uh, Proximity Technology was uh, a hardware software company that really specialized in you know, pattern recognition, pattern matching type of software and hardware. And one of the things I learned there was it takes a lot of capital and effort to build hardware, but the same thing can also be done in software. And sometimes the software solution is uh, getting you 80% of the way, but it can be deployed into a larger set of applications. And that really was an eye opener for me. Um, during those days, of course, you know, local area networks, ethernet was not common. Ethernet and networking was only for researchers, you know, connecting one university to another university. It was not really intended for common man, you know, things like email was just getting experimental phase of it, you know. Um, again, back in those days, while I was here at I IIT Madras, I would go to the computer science building. We used to have punched cards, you know, IBM 370 and punch cards. That's how I learned programming, Fortran programming through uh, punched cards. So uh, again, uh, you know, when we went to uh, mini computers, desktops, the one thing that became important was connecting them, local area networks. So that's where I moved to uh, Wang Labs and 
micro sun microsystems uh, i don't know if you've heard of sun microsystems they uh, were one of the pioneers of the spark chip and hardware and networking as well so uh, there i learned uh, everything about networking computers and uh, one of the things i learned was while uh, people were focusing on building a network uh, troubleshooting a network figuring out where there might be a problem in the network that required very special hardware so you had to have a $70000 you know box that you would plug into the bnc cable of a coax cable to tap into that and figure out which of the computers on the local area network was misbehaving right so that $70000 product was a hardware based device and what uh, you know one of the things uh, we figured uh, metric network systems again that was a startup that took that idea of a hardware based solution and trying to do that in software so we were able to um use a solution called tcp dump i think tcp dump is still being used uh so we took the tcp dump software and put it onto a sun microsystems hardware and made it do the same thing that the specialized hardware would do and this is where you know uh value creation by having a substitute product at a lower cost but being able to you know solve 80% of the problem or maybe even uh you know more than the 80% but in a different way that uh, idea of taking a, a concept proven in hardware but replicating in software <coughs> that value creation was uh, really very unique and that opened up uh, you know a bigger market for software right we were able to take uh, you know that particular same capability uh and deliver that in software uh and the funny story is that we were able to build that product with only four people and uh it took us six months right and so uh the funny story is that we were trying to figure out how to you know price that software right in pricing one of the things that we often think about is how much did it cost to make the software and then add a premium to that and then charge that so uh what we learned there was that is in fact a wrong model to think, think about pricing software right with software pricing is really tied to more about you know what value are you creating and how much is the value of the solution that you're offering and pricing it based on uh the value that you create and what someone is able to pay for getting that value so you know we had arguments you know among the early team that we should price it at you know 500 dollars per copy right but then somebody came and said you know no it's not 500 dollars per copy because we're replacing 70000 dollar product with this it should not be 500 it should be 10000 right which was ridiculously high given the cost it took to develop right so that's where we learned that it's not important to it's, it's it's not right to think about pricing something based on what it cost to make or what it costs you to make it especially in software it's really more about pricing it to um to to tie to the value that you're delivering right and and it took off you know the the product and the revenue took off simply because we priced it at the value that you know is still 10 10 times below the cost of the hardware right so think about it right uh, we actually had uh you know compet- competition which was uh selling the same value at uh, $70,000 and we were selling it for 7000 and our product had more benefits because you could deploy it anywhere the hardware box people had to rent they scheduled some time and it was inaccessible and as software was something that you could download and run and it was much faster to deploy and more useful to more people so given all those benefits we actually could be charging quite a bit larger quite a bit higher than uh you know what the hardware box was actually so that's where we learned that 
you know, it's important to price according to the value that you deliver. Uh, after that, I, you know, that company was acquired by Hewlett Packard. So I was at Hewlett Packard for a couple of years. Then I got a call from Microsoft. Microsoft was one of the biggest companies, you know, at that point, you know, 1985, 87, 80, you know, 90. During that period, Microsoft was just starting and we're really making big headways in software. So I uh, again took a chance, joined Microsoft as a software engineer. And this is the place where, you know, I, I graduated from just being a software engineer to more of a, you know, a team member around program management, interacting with product management, interacting with sales teams, customers, and really learned a lot more about software than just building the software. Right. So uh, again, those experiences were what I carried forward as I went to the next stage, which is Vital Science Software, which was about again application performance management, application performance diagnostics, and uh, there I got a chance to uh, you know join a, a team as a, a chief architect. So now I was actually architecting the entire product, building. Uh, the product for a large market. Rhapsody Networks, again, uh, I mentioned connections. After Vital Sign Software was acquired by Lucent Technologies, um, you know, I had an opportunity to join a venture capital firm, which was uh, Sequoia Capital. I joined uh, Sequoia Capital as an EIR. And the reason I was able to join that was, you know, at Vital Signs, the my manager, Jim Getz, who, uh, you know, um, was the person that took Vital Science you know, all the way to exit. After the exit, he joined a VC firm. And so, uh, you know, I, I got a chance to join that and uh, start something called, you know, Rhapsody Networks, which was more about hardware, software combination for storage virtualization. Again, something that I had no clue about from a technology standpoint. I took a chance on trying to learn something new. And, uh, you know, a combination of software hardware for storage virtualization. That company was acquired by Brocade Communications. Uh, I know most of you know Kumar Malavalli, uh, who's uh, also from here. So, uh, you know, he was one of the uh, co-founders of Brocade Communications. I learned a, a few things about running a large team. Here I was running a uh, 75 person hardware software team for building a complex software product, uh, you know, for storage virtualization. Clear one systems, again, uh, I made a change from, you know, uh, hardware software storage area network, storage network into more of a, uh, you know, e-discovery solution. Uh, the, the way it started was also very interesting. Uh, we started with the premise that, uh, you know, there is important information in emails that can be used for knowledge management. Uh, this was the time when Google went public, 2004. Google had a, uh, you know, tagline that we organize the world's information, right? So that was their tagline. But what they forgot was, you know, within enterprises, that information was outside the reach, you know, unlike, um, you know, public websites and HTML content, the content within companies was not accessible by Google for indexing and creating the search engine. So that's where we came in and we offered a similar platform, searching all your enterprise content. And uh, Clearwell was more about, you know, understanding your email conversations, looking through all the email content and attachments, and assigning uh, you know, value to the content and providing a mechanism to search through all your enterprise interactions and enterprise content. And that was a very successful product. Uh, it took us seven years to build the company. Uh, after seven years, we uh, sold the company to Symantec. Uh, that was at uh, you know, 400 million valuation. And after that, I started Clary. Clary has been <laughs> Um, you know, I started Clary 10 years ago along with my co-founder and during the period of 10 years, we built it into a strong um, revenue platform company. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey that uh, I went through in many of these startups, starting from seed stage to series A, series B, funding and what it took uh, along the way to build these companies, which I thought would be interesting. So looking out for myself, like, so for example, is there a specific, I mean, is it okay to kind of start some of these companies in your 40s, 30s, like, is there an age range, like, you know, uh, uh, that in your view, like, you know, or any age you can actually get into entrepreneurship, like, so. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I really feel that, un, you know, it's all about your passion and energy and commitment. As long as it is there, uh, you know, there is no age, uh, you know, consideration uh, in terms of starting a company. Um, obviously, you know, your health and ability to commit time to your startup uh, comes into play. Uh, at a certain age, you may not have the energy to do it, but as long as you have passion and energy to uh, do it, there is no uh, age consideration at all. Sure. Thank you. So Clary, fast facts, again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, 10 years into the journey now, uh, we have 750 employees, about 130 of them are in Bangalore. We have a Clary India office, uh, 130 people in, in Bangalore. Uh, we've raised around 350 million from top tier VC, Sequoia Capital, Bain, Sapphire, Madrona Ventures, Silver Lake, P Capital Group, and Blackstone. These are all, um, I would call, top tier VC firms. Um, you folks must have heard of all these companies that are, uh, all these VC firms that have, you know, spawned amazing companies. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, high-tech companies, you know, starting with, Cisco system, Yahoo, Google, uh, Apple, they've all been started through Sequoia Capital's initial investments. Uh, these days you hear about Palo Alto Networks, Zoom, uh, you know, they've all been funded by Sequoia Capital. Um, we have about 700 plus enterprise customers. These are large customers like Adobe, uh, you know, Palo Alto Networks, Zoom, Okta, they're all our customers. They use our solution to, you know, uh, manage their revenue generation and their revenue process, optimize their revenue process, optimize their sales team function, marketing function, um, and implement a, a rigor through the revenue generation process. So when we talk about pipeline, it is the revenue pipeline that companies generate. We managed around $2 trillion worth of revenue pipeline through our product. So I talked about uh, the value journey. Um, so seed stage. Seed stage is really an interesting stage. I think many of you, you know, if you're thinking about a startup, you probably are thinking, you know, where do I get some funds, right? So initial seed stage, uh, you probably are looking at you know, friends and family investors, some uh, you know um, angel investors, um, things like that. So um, so at a seed stage, what is your primary concern, right? It's really about you know incubating the idea, getting the idea, believing in the idea, uh, and and also having the ability to convince early stage investors to join the journey with you. Uh, it's probably such an early stage that you can't really prove a whole lot of product market fit. Uh, and I would say this is a time when as a co-founder, you might find yourself being very lonely. <laughs> uh, when I say that, you know, typically what happens is at this early stage, you're trying to convince a small number of people to join you. And in that conversation, you're trying to, you know, promote the idea to the best extent possible, right? And when you do that, uh, obviously, you know, no idea is, uh, you know, perfect. There are always some flaws with what you think is your idea. But you have nobody to talk to. Right. This is a time when it's very hard to, you know, uh, go back to the people that you've hired into your team or have them join your team. 
it's very hard for, for you to have a frank conversation about you know, is this idea going to work? Because at that point, you might find that you know, if you express a doubt about you know, a particular idea not being fully flushed out, it creates an uncertainty on the people that you're trying to bring in. So you kind of are putting uh, yourself into a shell where you are promoting the idea to the best extent possible. But at the same time, you know, you have some doubts in your own mind. How do you resolve that? So this is where I would say, you know, outside advisors, friends that you can trust, if you can get, you know, previous people that have started companies, interacting with them, go to mentorship teams and where you can get some, you know, outside help to sit down, listen to your idea and, you know, give their frank opinion. Maybe you should be open about, you know, taking their input in and reshaping your idea, not be so tied to your original idea <coughs> if it can be changed and altered and, you know, made to, you know, work with a slightly change it, you know. You might still have your original idea, but understand the boundaries of it and reshape it to the best extent possible. And you might just get, you know, some money and typically you go through something called a safe note. Simple, uh, you know, future value equity. Uh, simple agreement for future equity. That's what safe is. So you might be, you know, bringing in some money uh, and, and help go through the initial phase. Uh, I've gone through about six months to a year of not paying any employee. Just, you know, you know, in the initial stage, it's very hard because, you know, you don't have the money, you want to establish some product idea. And so this is really a trust-based initial few days when you have to, you know, work through building of the value, right? Uh, and when you get to a certain product idea, you know, you would go to a Series A venture firm and, you know, that's the path I took. Uh, other companies, you know, they try to bootstrap completely. Bootstrapping is harder because, you know, you have to first get some revenue and put it back into your product. Uh, and, and unless it's a very uh, well-known idea that you're able to really bootstrap very well, it's, it's hard to do uh, a big scale, scaling of your product just by bootstrapping, right? Um, one of the things you will find is uh, other, com other companies and other competitors, other ideas will compete with your product. And, and so in that phase, if you don't grow fast enough, you will find that you are falling behind. And so, you know, one of the big considerations in Series A would be, you know, how much equity do you keep within the founders and uh, how much are you willing to you know, negotiate with a Series A investor, venture firm or investor. So in my case, you know, it always would go from, you know, 30% to 25% of the company being, you know, uh, uh, diluted through VC money coming in. Uh, but that was a good thing because even though your ownership shrinks in terms of percentage, the pie becomes bigger. And in some cases, the early investors like Sequoia Capital were very helpful in reshaping, you know, the idea, getting more, uh, you know, strong exec team members, join the team, so really about building the team was very important. And in Series A investments, they will, you will find that the big thing that they look at are, you know, do you have a big market? They will see a future market opportunity, future market size. That becomes very important. Do you have strong initial team? Right. Those are the really big things that they would look at. Can you be a disruptor? Can you disrupt, uh, you know, uh, maybe a hardware solution with a software solution? Like we, I, a couple of examples I gave. By the time you get to Series B, though, you have to establish a product market fit. A product market fit is when, you know, you have built enough of the product and identified an ideal customer profile. And for that ideal customer, your product will fit and generate value. So that's very important for a Series B type of a, a BC round, right? And at that time, you also would have maybe five or 10 charter customers, initial <coughs> customers that have really used the product, have understood the value that it creates, 
and you have to really uh, you know embrace them as important chartered customers uh, one thing I would say also is when you bring a customer on board you cannot build something that is very specific to them you always should be thinking you know does it apply to more than one customer right can you generalize the product can you think about the product as something that would fit more customers than just the few chartered customers. In our case, we got chartered customers primarily through the VC firm introducing us to some of the customers. So again, this is the value of a, a strong VC firm. You know, they will connect you with their own portfolio companies where you can get you know, customer introductions. We could sit down with them, explain the product and get them to adopt the product. So that's how we got our Series B level of product market fit. After that, with Series C, you have to be thinking about revenue generation. Do you have a revenue machine? Uh, are you building out your sales team? Right? In Series C, people think about, you know, you've achieved a product market fit. Your value will be based on, can you hire a sales team and train them and get them to sell the product and scale your sales team? Right? Uh, so this is typically in the uh, you know revenue range of anywhere from you know 10 million to 50 million to 100 million range. So at that range, you want to be able to get sales team hired and train them, and it should be uh, you know simple enough for the salesperson to sell. If it's a very complex product, the salesperson has to go through a lot of convincing and a lot of you know. Uh, work trying to work with the customer to sell the product that is an impediment so you should try to simplify the sales process as much as possible help the sales team you know understand what the sales life cycle is starting from the early stage of the opportunity make sure that the sales team understands when they can advance a customer to the next stage and really put in a sales motion in place that becomes very important with sales D, E, and F, it's all about scaling your operations. Can you bring in the next level of leadership? You know, this is a time when you have 500 employees, maybe 1,000 employees. <laughs> what does it depend on? It depends on your team, your culture, you know, the next level team members that are, that are able to join. Uh, so for that, you need to be able to define the company's purpose very well. You need to be able to define a company's mission values and uh, you know be able to present a vision for a large group of people and this is where you know scaling the operation comes in right you have to be able to build the great uh, you know you have to have a good hiring machine you have to have the proper way of uh, you know governing the company all of that becomes very important you know uh, series d investors expect you to have all these things figured out, right? Why are they coming in? Because they're coming in thinking about, you know, the next level, which is IPO, right? At an IPO stage, you have to have efficiencies in place. There is something called rule of 40. Rule of 40 says, you know, if you're growing at 40% and you have a free cash flow of 0%, you are at a zero, you know, uh, rule of 40 company. Companies like Snowflake, uh, which you might have heard of, Right, they are they are a rule of forty company. What that means is they are growing at seventy percent, and their free cash flow is negative thirty percent or negative twenty percent. So they actually could be a rule of fifty company. So these are metrics now. You know, uh, metrics around um, how much money is coming in, how much is being spent on your building of the product, how much is being spent on customer acquisition. So customer acquisition cost is very important. Uh, operational cost efficiencies around what percentage of the company is being spent on R&D, what percentage of the company uh, expenses goes towards marketing and sales. So those ratios become super important when you want to go uh, test the IPO market. So uh, again, you know, growth engine is another factor, which is if you have an IPO, and investors are investing money in the company. Can you take that money and you know uh, provide a greater return 
uh, over a certain period of time. And typically in software companies, you know, discounted uh, cash flow would come in, which means that if you have, you know, um, cash coming in and you have a certain growth rate and you still have not achieved profitability, is your profitability over a period of next five years? And if it's over a five-year period, at the end of five years, if you say that your operations will turn profitable, uh, at the end of those five years, you know, there is a, uh, a, a math that people would do as an investor. Would the money that you put in in the stock today over a five-year period, would that yield better return compared to putting it into a bond market at a certain, you know, uh, fixed income bond portfolio? Right? So that equation has to turn favorable for you to attract, you know, stock investors. So all those factors will have to match for you to go to an IPO and have a public listing. So along the way, product foundation has to evolve. Uh, right from Series A all the way to Series Series D, E, F, and IPO, your product needs to evolve to get better and better. More value to customer, bigger product, bigger product footprint, more customer. All of that will matter. Sales model evolution starts with Series B. You have to reinvent your selling model. You know, are you selling through you know, consumption model pricing versus subscription model pricing? All of that will matter. Platform and ecosystem comes into play series C afterwards, series C, series B. Um, a lot of the times you will find that if your company's growth is based on just your employees, that is not enough. You have to establish a business model where your ecosystem and partners who are in your environment, they add value to your company by being in the ecosystem. Some examples are like Salesforce. Salesforce has a development platform. They have around 30,000 ISVs, software vendors, who develop on the platform. And when they develop you know, their solutions on the Salesforce platform, the platform becomes more valuable. And so you know, those are the kinds of things that unlocks the value of your product to a larger and larger group of people. And that kind of leverage is what drives higher value. So I talked a lot about revenue, revenue and revenue engine. For me, you know, if you build any company, revenue is the most important function. Revenue is the most critical department of any company. Why? Because the revenue that you generate is what feeds back into your own company. Right? You can reinvest back into the company. And when you, when you can grow your revenue, uh, most of the employees will be happy, you know, if, if you have appropriate, you know, uh, infrastructure in place, uh, shareholders are happier, you know, as your revenue grows, shareholder growth, shareholder value gets increased, right, so that's very important. So I would say, you know, among all the different departments, those that touch revenue, mission, revenue critical employees in a company are really the, the most important resource. Right, and uh, it's not enough to build a product, it has to be sold, it has to be marketed properly. You have to have a proper revenue engine, you have to think about a proper revenue model. All that becomes super important for a successful company. And so, Clary, you know, again, our mission is to help companies, you know, uh, improve their revenue process. So, we talk about this notion of going from the boardroom to the front lines. Uh, you know, Clary has solutions in place so that you can, uh, you know, optimize your go-to-market function. Right, go-to-market is all about, you know, having a marketing engine to generate leads, take those leads, uh, you know, run it through a sales process, uh, book your orders, and then after you book your order, generating revenue from it. All of that is part of your go-to-market function. So you have to be thinking about revenue generation models, marketing and demand gen programs, product market fit. All of these are important considerations. And so when you define a strategy, executing that in a boardroom to frontline strategy is part of the go-to-market function. So again, operationalizing growth means 
you know, you have to align on strategic growth initiatives. So as a company, you know, you make some commitments to investors. You know, Wall Street, you know, you have to commit to certain growth target for upcoming year. And when you do that, you have to be better informed about what to commit, right? So, uh, again, one of the challenges you will find, right, uh, in business, there is no, uh, no direct answer or no straight answer, right? As you are, you know, in your student life, you probably have seen problems where you get a certain input and you put it into a problem, you get an output, right? And, and you verify whether the output is correct or not. But when you go to, you know, building a company or building a go-to-market strategy, you know, you have so much uncertainty, right? So typically you have to first align on, you know, some set of strategic growth initiatives. And those initiatives are, you know, based on partial information. You have to commit to certain targets. And so once you commit to those targets, you have to be constantly monitoring. Are we executing to those targets? So you have to be able to measure you know, uh, am I executing to a certain target? And to be able to do that, you have to instrument your pipeline, instrument every stage of your revenue process, collect all the data, analyze all the data, and create some insights, you know. Uh, uh, at this stage in the year, I am, you know, 20% behind my target. So how do you close that 20%? To close that 20%, you have to evaluate which uh, you know, revenue methods worked well in the past and then tweak them, right? You should be able to, you know, adjust your process based on past data. Sometimes you may not have enough data. You still have to make a commitment uh, as a team, you know, and then uh, execute to a certain plan. So executing to that plan means you should be able to track each person's activity. Are they acting according to what we planned? Are they, you know, able to execute? What are the impediments to their execution? Can you remove those roadblocks? And can you get them to execute to the plan so that, you know, at the end of it, you're able to reach your targets, right? All of that is through instrumentation. So typically you have SaaS software, you know, go-to-market strategies. You start with a product-led company. You know, it's really about, you know, freemium. You may have a freemium free software you try it for a few months, and then you convert them into paid subscription. Sometimes you would have land and expand. So sometimes you might have pricing and feature tiers. All of these are different strategies in your go-to-market strategy. And um, happy to work with all of any of you. You know, if you have some specific idea on this is my go-to-market strategy, does it make sense? Happy to you know uh, learn about your thinking there and help you out. You know, as you start your companies. Sales-led is more about, you know, you have a product, it's not product-led, you know, in the sense that you have to hire a sales team. And that sales team needs to go in front of customers and they have to explain the benefits of the product. So that is, you know, what I would call a sales, sales-led go-to-market strategy. And there you focus a lot on marketing, demand gen, right? You, you have things like, Sales development reps, SDRs, or RDRs, revenue uh, development rep representatives. They, they are the people that you know uh, organize trade events, collect leads, put them through a sales process. There is also an element of upsell, which is you know you have a customer that has already bought a product. Can they can you can they purchase an additional product from you in a related area? So expansion, expansion of you know, customer footprint and customer nurturing, all of that becomes important. So typically in a go-to-market strategy development, you first identify something called an ICP. We call ICP ideal customer profile. Ideal customer profile is that narrow segment that likes to buy your product because it fills a specific need in that narrow segment, right? You may not be able to you may have a, a grand idea which you know you think will meet the needs of you know 100% of a market right but it may not because you know it, it doesn't have all the capabilities to address the entire 100% but you might find that in a particular segment there is a better fit for your product 
So for example, if you have a contract, um, you know, um, document uh, analysis or contract document signing product or something like that or a blockchain product that focuses on contract execution, not every company will be ready to adopt that. There might be some ideal customers which you identify. So once you've identified that, you have to be very specific on you know, messaging. Your features have to match what the ideal customer wants. And so, and then you have to identify within that customer, who is the one who's going to buy the product. Many times you will find that, you know, in a B2B sales context, the person who buys the product is different from the, the person that uses the product, right? So budget will be different. So basically you have to have your values and messaging target the actual buyer and the value that you generate for the buyer. And once you do all of this, you have to be measuring constantly. You know, is my message working? Is my target uh, properly identified? Are my salespeople able to sell to the ICP in a way that makes the sales process work, right? All of that needs to be measured through instrumentation. And then you would iterate. If you have a strategy change, if you have to pivot, um, you know, you need to be able to do that and then refine your strategy chain and then continue re-executing. So basically it's a cycle back, you know, continues back and forth. I talked a bit about ICP, you know, again, very important to get that ideal customer profile identified because they are the ones who have the best product market fit. Uh, you may have to be thinking about, you know, solving a problem for a narrow space in a larger space and then expanding it over time, right? So you have to be rethinking about, you know, can I build a product for you know, the first five to 10 customers who would be your rabid megaphone customers who would go and announce themselves, you know, I purchased this product, I used it, and I got this benefit. Are they able to speak on your behalf, right? Are they able to evangelize your product? So if you can identify that ideal customer and work with them to do that, that's how you get started. You know, and then you continue expanding the product to get into more and more of the customers who would actually adopt a product. Go-to-market measurement, again, I talked about instrumenting the go-to-market engine. Customer acquisition cost, it's very important, right? You cannot spend a large part of your investment money into sales and marketing. It has to be appropriately, uh, you know, resourced, if you will, so that your customer acquisition costs are understood well, and then you will be constantly iterating so that you're reducing your customer acquisition cost. Um, again, you have to be thinking about lead to opportunity conversion. Once you get a lead in, are you able to convert them into the next stage of your pipeline? And how much money and time is spent in converting from a very initial stage lead expression of interest in buying a product to closing the customer and really delivering the product. So sales performance, you would measure things like, you know, opportunity to close, sales stages, conversion ratios, things like sales cycle, timelines, rep attainment rates. These are all the metrics you'll be constantly measuring to improve your efficiency of your sales process. Lifetime value is important. You know, sometimes you would acquire a customer at a high cost, but they are going to be a customer for five, six, seven years. So that means that once you acquire, you know, they are going to be paying you for the next, you know, um, certain amount of time. And so it is really very important to get your LTV also established. So again, in the customer journey phase, you have to identify, you know, all the different metrics in continue increasing your value that you deliver to your customers. And in this process, you would go through this value life cycle, you know, discover what a customer wants, um, you know, and then basically you have to ensure that the value that they expect from your product is realized and then try and optimize it. And this life cycle, you know, value life cycle continues on, right? Very important to get this part going. So I want to switch gears a bit, you know, uh, aside from the business aspect of it, I want to just touch on a few of the, you know, personal learnings along the way. I'm going to share with you in the, with the hope that, you know, you can take something away and benefit from it. 
I would say, you know, again, the most important part that I learned along the way is building your network. Uh, you know, building your network, uh, you know, it can be your professional network, social network, personal network, super important to, you know, continue building you know, all kinds of uh, people networks that, that are in your uh, in your span of life, right? So starting with, uh, you know, right from your very first job, super important to, you know, work with the people around you uh, and, and really work in a way that uh, they appreciate the value that you deliver to them. And it's all about your value to them, right? And, and if you are able to do that, um, that really is going to pay dividends uh, as you continue on. So to give you a best example, as I mentioned, when I was at Metrics Network Systems, uh, I had a, you know, this product called Netmetrics, which was the network monitoring product. And uh, there was an opportunity to, you know, this was an East Coast based company in Boston area. And there was an opportunity for me to come to the West Coast and, uh, you know, work with uh, another company to make this product work with their company's product. It was a partnership arrangement. And in that partnership, um, you know, I worked for about three months on this partnership program with uh, uh, another manager, Jim Getz, was in that other company. And uh, he later became a top-notch VC, right? And he remembered me from the work I did, you know, five years back, 10 years back. And that was enough for him to realize that, you know, that I could be trusted and that I could be, you know, one that I, that I, that, that my company can be invested in. And so basically he, he took on a chance on me knowing what I had done in the past, right? And I, I can also tell you, you know, uh, many times um, I, I would, uh, I would get uh, an opportunity to introduce someone to another person. Right. Take all of those opportunities as uh, something that uh, that you can help in, right? And so, again, I mentioned help where you can, right? You never know when you might need their help, right? Super important to build your networks. You know, join various clubs, join, you know, entrepreneurship clubs or mentorship clubs, interact with people, get their ideas. Uh, super important to uh, you know, build your network. Um, at Microsoft, I had a great opportunity to interact with top leaders um, in my program management role. Um, again, got a chance to work with Bill Gates and all the people there in senior management. Um, so that was uh, something that I, that I uh, really cherished as I was building my network. Um, again, connect people if, even if it is not to your benefit, even if you don't see a benefit, you just go ahead and you know do what you can to connect people. Super important um, as well. Be aware of your brand. I say that because you know sometimes you get caught up in day-to-day -day, uh, disagreements with people. Uh, you know there have been a number of number of times when you uh, you know in your interactions with people you you may lose your brand in the sense that people may not. Um, not have a positive view, right? So again, this is where if I feel like, you know, if it is, um, there, there's something called EQ, right? Uh, not just IQ, emotional quotient of a person is something that you build on over a period of time. Um, how you are able to handle various situations, people interactions, all of that will matter in building your brand. Leadership skills. <laughs> uh, many times, you know, you will reach a point where, you know, you're given a challenge, right? And uh, super important to, again, take the challenge. Uh, find your growth, growth edge, as I call it, right? Sometimes you may not, uh, it may not be something that you're comfortable doing, but, you know, choosing to accept the challenge when you haven't done it in the past and growing in the process, learning something from it, 
you know, test your growth edge, right? Go all the way to the edge and, uh, you know, there's nothing like failure at all. You know, when you do something that you've never done before, you reach your growth edge, uh, you only have a learning experience from it. Again, you know, there is never, uh, never, never something that you not learn from. There's always something you can learn from everything that you try, right? Um, be a partner to senior management, right? I didn't grow to be in the senior management position uh, overnight, right? I, I had to interact with other people who were part of senior management. And, uh, you know, positive vibes, having a positive view on things, you, you know, working with senior people, in a positive way, uh, you know, is super important again. Uh, with that, you gain some, again, EQ, uh, ability to handle various situations, um, so very important. Effectively communicate disagreements. A lot of the times, you, you will have a different viewpoint. How to communicate effectively to uh, other people you know, very important in the sense that uh, as you go uh, interact with more and more senior people, you will find that nobody wants to hear their views put down, right? Uh, you know, the everybody wants wants to hear positive things about what they say, but it could be wrong, right? In your mind, you have a different viewpoint. How do you communicate effectively? How do you uh, challenge the view without coming across as negative and you know uh, not contributing to the cause right very important to establish communicate in a way that promotes the the company that promotes the project promotes your organization is uh, again a skill that uh, uh, that I took away along the way um, creating win-win situations, you know, especially with peer-to-peer -peer interactions, you know, you may have a project where you have to work together, uh, try to establish a win-win situation. Uh, also important for salespeople, when a salesperson is selling to a customer, um, you know, you have to articulate your value in a way that they feel like they're winning with you together, right, a win-win partnership. The last one, I call it flip the script, which is something that I promote a lot. When people come and ask me, you know, um, what, what do I do? Uh, I have a problem. What, what do I need to do to overcome the problem? Right? I kind of go back and say, this is why I call it flip the script. Go back and think about, you know, what can you do to solve the problem? Come back to me with what you can do to overcome the problem, not come to me, you know, here is a problem, what do you suggest, right? Uh, that That's okay to a certain point, but I think at a certain stage, people expect and value you more if you can offer a solution. Um, you know, again, uh, this is something that we practice a lot within my company. You know, when someone comes and asks, you know, uh, here is a prop hairy problem, um, you know, you be the problem solver, not the problem creator, right? Problem reporter or problem creator. Uh, perspective. I think I mentioned this already. Even if you uh, go to your growth edge, take a chance, and it doesn't pan out, right? Try to figure out what can you learn from it, right? Ask yourself, right? What am I learning today from what I'm doing? Uh, and is what I'm doing contributing to the long term, right? You may have a short term setback, but is the long term uh, goal, long term target that you have, are you going towards that, right? Is there positive something that you can take from a setback that you have, right? Again, life's lessons, right? Um, super helpful there. I call it, you know, life is a marathon, not a sprint. Don't just plan for your short term, plan for the long term. And finally, enjoy the journey, right? If you enjoy the journey, everything will happen.
right? You, you feel more passionate, you feel more committed, you get enjoyment from every moment, and all the distractions don't matter. You are more committed, more focused, simply because you know you are enjoying the journey. And don't don't be so focused on the outcome, right? If your journey is good, if you're enjoying it and you're putting in the work, the outcome will take care of itself, right? Again, life is a journey. Opening it up for any questions. Yes. How was your seed stage journey? Since it, our uh, first step is always the hardest to take. Your seed stage journey. Seed stage for yeah. some of my companies. Uh, for you, how was it? Uh, again, um, the first companies were hard. Uh, Clearval was uh, okay. Metric systems. Uh, what we did was we uh, actually had three people. Two people were doing consulting work, and the money would come in from consulting, and part of that money would go into product development. And the consulting part worked because we were consulting to Sun Microsystems, it was one of the companies where, that I mentioned here, and that. You know, during the consulting process, we learned a lot about what to build because we were consulting in an area where we were actually working with the customer. So we took that idea and used that as seed funding uh, for our product. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I was asking more about funding. Uh, yeah. Wasn't it very hard to get convince people that you could do that something? Yeah, that's the time when, uh, you know, you have to develop the skill of articulating your idea clearly and, uh, you know, uh, keeping the faith in what you're building and what you're trying to do. And making others also believe that the teammates should build that trust. Right, that's right. Yeah, you should, you should uh, for making them to work with you for many months without... Uh, without a salary. Yeah, and, yeah. 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 How did you manage that? I think what you will find is in your friends network, people who believe and who want to work with you, uh, is kind of how I, how I would start, right? It's a very early stage, you know, you have to form, you know, form friendship based partnerships with your, you know, close network and have them join you in the journey, right? Yes. So networking is, I think, the key for this whole. Right. Right. So the question, I have a couple of questions. The one thing is that uh, how it is, is from your point of view, how it must uh, it was more supportive if you would have started as a fresh just after as, as a graduate, or when you are having already industry experience of four five years. Right. So which would have been a better choice, or what helped you in this? I think for me, you know, the learnings, you know, in working in a, a startup company, not as a founder, understanding how startup companies build their value was super helpful. I did not jump in right away from college into a startup. Because we, we have to understand what uh, confidence or where we can uh, you know, exactly contribute. Right. On the basis of that only we can, uh, you know, more uh, free to take a stake on ourselves as a in my journey, I, I took a certain path, yeah. but of course, you know, all of you have your own way. Of, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know. One more thing is that uh, about the product when you are providing a solution to the uh, market. So we have two scenarios, probably there will be many more. We have a totally new product, no one using. We have a solution to some problem and uh, no such product exists in the market. Right. And the other thing is that we are already providing, just like you said, you provided a software to existing, uh, you know. Replacing, replacing the software. Correct, correct. Right. So how it is easier or difficult, you know, under these two scenarios? Yeah, so, so if customer. you have a product that is solving a problem for which no other person is solving the problem, uh, that is a scenario where you have to ask yourself, why is it not being solved by any other person? And that then, itself might be an indicator. And then, uh, the, uh, the question which uh, further follows is that uh -huh. how we are going to evaluate its cost, pricing. 
because something is existing in the market we can say our price is half of it or 20 percent 10 percent right when then you would look at you know uh, is it saving some time for the customer right if it is saving you know um, 100 hours of work you would try to convert 100 hours of work you save for the customer and you would try to articulate right with this product you are replacing 100 hours of work by 10 hours of work and, and in that process you know you establish the value that that you're saving and based on that you could say my products uh, contribution you know or my product is helping you save this much so my pricing for my product is one third of that just an example right and so that's how you would start to think about the pricing of your solution you know, based on whether it's cost savings or increase in growth of the growth of the customer some some metric around what you're achieving from a business outcome for the customer and pegging the value of your product to the outcome that you're creating for the customer. Maybe that's one way to think about it. So I have one question uh, related to the go to the market strategies. Yeah. Right? So, you're talking about, so these days we have this idea of lean startup methodology. Yes. So uh, getting a minimal viable product and getting right. that iterated over time. Yes. So was it similar that you followed during your... Absolutely. Okay. I followed MVP, I followed product market fit. All of that was exactly according to that label. Uh, you know, lead startup is exactly what we follow. Right. And it's just uh, a follow-on question just to that. So, uh, so how does it relate to a, a hardware space? Uh, because in software, you can get an MVP done right. and quickly iterate on it. But how does it relate to a hardware space? I mean, something that we have physical product in manufacturing. Right. Uh, one of my companies, Rhapsody Networks, was a hardware product. Uh, and again, here is where, you know, uh, we took a concept and we uh, did some software-based simulations of what the hardware would do. And then we created a, uh, you know, sales, you know, uh, VC pitch for that. And then we got funding based on the hardware product. Uh, yeah, right here. This continuation of what he was asking about uh whether you should start your company fresh as a graduate or after right. a few years experience, what you were asking, right? Yes. Uh, and I don't know if I'm right. You don't have to have the experience and the connects yourself. As Sir was saying, you probably can build a team. You know, there might be some seniors in your team who might bring in that value of, for example, a person who's been in the industry or uh, something yes. of that kind. So he could bring in that uh, connections and you can bring in the tech. <coughs> So, I don't know. If, uh, that works yeah. as well. Um, again, that has worked well once you reach a certain stage. Okay. Because the person who comes in with experience and knowledge of the industry, they have to take a leap of faith in joining you. Right. And that uh, conversation um, carries with it a certain element of trust in you and you. Uh, so for that to happen, you have to prove something Very true. for them to join you. Yes. Right. Uh, I've brought in you know senior leaders into my company at CDC, Series B, Series E, but not very early on. Okay. Right. So when you started your business, was it from business to business to customer, or it went already like from business to business? Uh, I'm mostly business to business. I haven't done any B two C companies. Okay. All of my companies are B2B. So what do you think is the difference from B2C to B2B? I think one of the, uh, you know, sales model techniques, uh, you know, premium to paid conversion, th those kinds of models work well for B2C companies. Uh, I am not an expert on B2C companies and building companies like me. Any other questions? Have we run past the time? I'm not sure how. I have one, but let others ask. Okay. Okay.
Yes. Um, sir, in your market uh, journey, you will be encountering uh, various competitors as well, right? Right. Uh, because it's not monopoly. Yes. Uh, so, like, did you have to deal with negotiations with any other companies as well? Or <coughs> is, it, is it only on your strategies as well that you are following based on the customers? Right. So, we have largely tended to ignore competition. Uh, and listen more to customers and what they want. Largely, you know, not focused on replicating or, un you know, understanding. Yeah, and a follow-up question would be, uh, is, I mean, have you been, like, affected because of the competition and how did you uh, come up with some certain strategies to get into the, get back into the track? I mean. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So basically what we do is understand the areas where the competitor is focused on and in some cases we would have strategies around you know flank flanking strategy you know go to an adjacent product focus more on the adjacent product not be concerned about drawn not be drawn into the same strategy that a competitor is following um, so in that way we adapt our go to market strategy uh, but we haven't been impacted by a competitor coming and taking market share from us because we find we are able to find uh, other ways to go to market. So I think we can close with this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank any, you all. any more questions, please do send it to us and then we can get it answered for you. Thank you so much. So on behalf of IIT Madras, and on behalf of the Office of Alumni and Corporate Relations, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Venkat D. Rangan for this insightful session. It was indeed a very informative session, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking out your precious time from your busy schedule. I would also like to thank the audience for your presence and contribution in making this session a grand success. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for coming back and uh, addressing this group here. Thank you, Angelina, for all the work. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.